Welcome to the Hand in Hand with God YouTube channel, where the sermons are filled with the Word of God, so you can apply God's truth to your life as you glean them from the teachings that are brought to you by myself, Pastor Daryl Clausen, but more importantly, they're brought to you by the Holy Spirit. Apply God's truth to your life so that He can mold you and shape you into who He wants you to be so that you can shine bright for Him through your words and actions. God bless you as you watch the video. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Hand in Hand with God, a flowing fountain lifestyle, a time where we gather together in a corporate setting and we delve into the Word of God with open hearts, allowing God's Word to mold us and shape us into who He wants us to be. Let's open with a word of prayer, and then we'll delve into the Word of God. Father God Almighty King, Lord, we thank you for bringing us together, God, for this time to worship you and to learn more about you, Father God, Lord of heaven and earth. Thank you again, Lord, for this time together that we have the freedom to gather in a corporate setting, Lord, to praise and worship you and to glean truths from your word that we can apply to our lives, Father God. Lord God, we dedicate this time to you and I thank you, God, for the opportunity to share your word. I pray, Lord, that I would say what you want me to say and that those who are listening to the sermon, Father, would work with the Holy Spirit to apply your truth to their lives, Father. We thank you and praise your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to take this opportunity to once again welcome you to Hand in Hand with God. So, welcome. If it's your first time, welcome and we're glad you chose to come out this afternoon. For those of you who are regulars, welcome and it's good to be back together with you guys. My name is Daryl Clausen and I'll be sharing the Word of God with you today. Today's sermon is a continuation from last week's sermon. Therefore, it's entitled, Jesus is the Lamb of God, Part 2. Last week we learned that God had to implement animal sacrifices because Adam and Eve sinned, and sin has to be dealt with. The blood from the animal sacrifices only covered people's sins because animal sacrifices in and of themselves are a shadow of what the blood of Jesus does for us. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from our sins, but the blood from animal sacrifices only covered people's sins because the blood of animals cannot wash away an individual's sins. Today we are going to continue looking at Jesus being the Lamb of God who came to earth to take away the sins of humanity in general and yours personally. When Jesus came to earth and was crucified on Calvary, he was the Lamb of God, dying for the sins of every human being. After Adam and Eve sinned, God had promised that Jesus would come and die for the sins of humankind, giving us the opportunity to have a healthy relationship with God, because then we could have our sins forgiven once and for all. Hebrews 10 verse 10 says, by this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the blood of Jesus Christ once for all time. Herein lies a problem. For so many years in history, priests were repeatedly offering sacrifices of animals, but this method never actually took care of sin. Therefore, people's sin still had to be dealt with. The relationship that God had or could have with individuals was not what it could be, because there was still sin in people's lives. I think this is one reason why God didn't like sacrifices sacrifices and offerings, because they truly didn't do anybody any good. I also think that God didn't like sacrifices, because it meant the death of an animal, an innocent animal at that. And when God created everything, He saw that it was good, and creation can 
obtained no death. Let's look at Hebrews 10, verses 5 to 10. Therefore, when he came into the world, he says, You have not desired sacrifice and offering, but you have prepared a body for me. You have not taken pleasure in whole burnt offerings and offerings for sin. Then I said, Behold, I have come. It is written of me in the scroll of the book to do your will, O God. After saying above, sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and offerings for sin you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. And verse 10, By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. In Hebrews 10 verses 5 to 7, the author of Hebrews is giving us a conversation that Jesus had with Father God. In this conversation between Jesus and Father God, Jesus said to our Heavenly Father that he didn't want sacrifices and offerings, and because our Heavenly Father doesn't desire sacrifices and burnt offerings, he prepared a body for Jesus. There was a problem, but with God there is no problem that cannot be overcome. The problem was that people were sacrificing animals, which didn't give our Heavenly Father any pleasure. Jesus comments to his Heavenly Father that in the book, what we call the Old Testament, there are writings about him. Jesus volunteers to the Heavenly Father that he himself will go and do his will. Thus, Jesus is going to fulfill the prophecies that were prophesied about him in the Old Testament. We have proof of this in Matthew when Jesus says that he came to fulfill the Old Testament. Matthew 5 verses 17 to 18 says, Do not presume that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I said to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter nor stroke of a letter shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. If you have any question regarding Jesus voluntarily leaving his throne to come to earth to die for our sins, you must read this passage, John 10 verses 14 to 18, which says, I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, and I have other sheep that are not in this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. And verse 17, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, so that I may take it back. And verse 18, No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it back. This commandment I received from my Father. Jesus knew that if he didn't come to earth to fulfill the prophecies that were written about him, then mankind would never be cleansed of their sins. The instructions that our Heavenly Father gave to Moses regarding animal sacrifices had to come to their end because they weren't pleasing God. As a matter of fact, God didn't even want sacrifices, offerings, burnt offerings, and offering for sin to take place, nor did he have pleasure in them because they were offered according to the law. 
Even though God didn't get any pleasure from animal sacrifices, the sacrifices had to continue until Jesus came as the Lamb of God and died for the sins of humanity. Jesus knew what had to be done. Therefore, Jesus told both his and our Heavenly Father that he would go and do the will of his Heavenly Father. When Jesus came and died for our sins, he came as the Lamb of God and did away with the Aaronic priesthood which the Israelites were living under and started a whole new priesthood which we who make up the body of Christ are a part of. The Passover Lamb, Exodus 12, verse 5. Although animal sacrifices didn't remove sin from an individual, God still had specific requirements for the animals that were being sacrificed. For example, when it came to the Passover lamb, God required that the Passover lamb being sacrificed be perfect. Exodus 12 verse 5 says, Your lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. The first Passover sacrifice was done by the Israelites when they were leaving Egypt. It was called Passover because the Israelites put the blood from the lamb that they had killed on the doorposts. And when the angel of death saw the blood on the doorposts, he passed over the house. Therefore, the Israelites' firstborn children weren't killed, but the Egyptians were. Exodus 12, verses 12 to 14, 22 to 23, and 28 to 30. For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night and fatally strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the human firstborn to animals, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live, and when I see the blood I will pass over you, and no plague will come upon you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Now this day shall be a memorial to you, and you shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you are to celebrate it as a permanent ordinance. Verse 22, And you shall take a bunch of hyssop, and dip it in the blood which is in the basin, and apply some of the blood that is in the basin to the lintel and the two doorposts, and none of you shall go outside the door of his house until morning. 23. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians, but when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to strike you. Verse 28. Then the sons of Israel went and did so, just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. Now it came about at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of cattle. And verse 30, And Pharaoh got up in the night, he and all his servants, and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was no home where there was not someone dead. When the Israelites were obedient to God's instruction regarding what to do with the Passover lamb, they were delivered from the angel of death. The Egyptians, on the other hand, were not spared from the angel of death because they did not put the blood of the lamb on the doorposts. Therefore, their firstborn child and the firstborn animals of their livestock were killed. The blood of the Passover lamb for the Israelites 
Israelites delivered them from the angel of death. And the same is true for us regarding the blood of Jesus. If we believe that Jesus Christ died for our sins as the Lamb of God, we are delivered from our sinful nature. Our sins are forgiven and we have eternal life. Those who do not believe in the blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins will not ask God to forgive them of their sins. Therefore, they will die in their sins. Not having their sins forgiven, they will spend eternity in hell, separated from God. God delivering the Israelites from Egypt was such an important event in their history that God told them to always celebrate it. We see just how important it was to God that the Israelites annually celebrate God delivering them from Egypt. For this, we will read Exodus 12, verses 17 and 24. You shall also keep the feast of unleavened bread, for on this very day I brought your multitudes out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall keep this day throughout your generations as a permanent ordinance. And verse 24, And you shall keep this event as an ordinance for you and your children forever. This is what was taking place in Jerusalem before, during, and for a few days after the time when Jesus was being crucified on the cross of Calvary for the sins of every human being throughout the ages past, present, and the ones to come. The Israelites were celebrating Passover. Romans 5 verse 12. Thus we could summarize everything so far, stating that we have sin which entered the world because of Adam and Eve's disobedience to God, and sin can only be dealt with through the blood of Jesus. However, until Jesus came to earth in God's timing to die for the sins of humanity, God had to implement animal sacrifices to be a shadow of the blood of the innocent. Jesus, the Son of God, taking away the sins of the guilty. Romans 5 verse 12 says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all mankind, because all sinned. From that time onward, from the time that Adam and Eve sinned, we have people sinning and their sin needed and needs to be dealt with. But sin can only be dealt with through the blood of an innocent man. But all men are born into sin. Therefore, no man is innocent. God promised that Jesus will come and he will be that innocent sacrifice. Genesis 3.15 is that promise. It says, And I will make enemies of you and the woman, and of your offspring and her descendant. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. We know that Genesis 3 verse 15 is God's promise to send Jesus because when he says her seed, it means that Jesus doesn't have an earthly father, only an earthly mother. However, until then, animal sacrifices would have to be done to symbolize the necessity of the shedding of blood to deal with sin. The Lamb of God is the Son of God. Luke 1 verses 26 to 35. We know that the fulfillment of God's promise to send the Savior was just around the corner when the angel Gabriel came to visit Mary. Let's read Luke 1 verses 26 to 35. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. 
And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and was pondering what kind of greeting this was. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and give birth to a son, and you shall name him Jesus. Verses 32 and 33. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. But Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And verse 35. The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. For that reason also the Holy Child will be called the Son of God. Luke 1 verses 32, 33, and 35 all point to the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Therefore, we know that Jesus is the Son of God. Now that we know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and born without sin, let's look into him being the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God is the one who God chose to die for the sins of humanity. John 1 verse 29 says, The next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Here Jesus the disciple John records John the Baptist referring to Jesus as the Lamb of God. While Jesus' disciple John was on the island of Patmos, he was given a vision which is recorded as Revelation, the last book of the Bible, and it quite often refers to Jesus as the Lamb of God. Revelation 12 verses 10 to 11. Then I heard a voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come, for the accuser of our brothers and sisters have been thrown down, the one who accuses them before our God day and night. And verse 11, And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life, even when faced with death. Revelation 17, verses 12 to 14. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings, who have not yet received a kingdom, but they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. These have one purpose, and they give their power and authority to the beast. And verse 14, These will rage war against the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, because he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And those who are with him are the called and chosen and faithful. Revelation 21, verse 27, And nothing unclean, and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb book of life. Revelation 22 verses 1 to 3. And he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street, on either side of the river, was the tree of life, bearing twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And verse 3, There will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his bondservants will serve him. Revelation 6 verses 15 to 17 Then the kings of the earth and the eminent people and the commanders and the wealthy and the strong and every slave and free person hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. 
And they said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the sight of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. And verse 17, For the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Proof that the passages which we just read from Revelation are talking about Jesus when they mention the Lamb is found in Revelation 19 verses 11 to 16 description of Jesus which says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many crowns, and he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And verse 16, And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We can clearly see in those passages from Revelation, the Son of God and the Lamb of God are the same person. Therefore, because Jesus is the Son of God, he is also the Lamb of God. If we bring John 1 verse 1 and verse 14 into the conversation, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. We see that when the Bible is referring to the Word of God, Jesus Christ, and the Lamb of God, it is talking about the Son of God, the second member of the Holy Trinity. There Therefore, Jesus is the Lamb of God. From Scripture, there is no doubt that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We read it earlier, but here it is again. John 1, verse 29. The next day he saw Jesus coming to him, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Not only because it is blatantly obvious from John 1 verse 29, but it is a common theme mentioned throughout Scripture that we know that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God. Long before Jesus Christ came as the Lamb of God to die for our sins, animal sacrifices were being done to demonstrate what Jesus would do as the Lamb of God. In the same manner as an animal sacrifice had to be perfect, the Lamb of God, whom God would have sacrificed for the sins of humankind, would also have to be perfect. Leviticus 9 verse Verse 3 says, Then you shall speak to the sons of Israel, saying, Take a male goat as a sin offering, and a calf, and a lamb, both one year old, without defect, as a burnt offering. Let's see what Peter has to say about the Lamb of God in 1 Peter 1, verses 18 to 23. Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before 
before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Since you have purified your souls in obedience to the truth, for a sincere love of the brothers and sisters, fervently love one another from the heart. And verse 23, For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is, through the living and enduring word of God. Now that the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, has died for the sins of humanity, there is no longer a need for animals to be sacrificed. We can all agree that each individual is guilty of his or her own sins. Therefore, an animal that is killed for someone's sin is innocent of the sin which they are being sacrificed for. Jesus Christ took upon himself the sins of the world, even though he was innocent of sin, not even committing one sin for himself. In conclusion, let's read 2 Corinthians 5, verses 18 to 21. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their wrongdoings against them. And he had committed to us the word of reconciliation reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Verse 21, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. There you have it. It's stated right here in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who died for the sins of humanity, which includes your sins, because that was the only way sin could be permanently dealt with. There was a time on earth when no sacrifices for sin needed to be done. However, that all changed as soon as Adam and Eve disobeyed God. From the moment that Adam and Eve sinned against God to Christ's crucifixion on Calvary, animal sacrifices for the sins of people were a necessity. However, the act of sacrificing animals for sins was a shadow of what was to come with Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God, taking upon himself the sins of the world, which only he could do, because as the Son of God, there was no sin in him. Let's pray. If God has placed something on your heart, you can take that up with him directly. As for the rest of you, I invite you to pray a corporate prayer with me in which there's an opportunity to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. And then we'll talk to God about us having a deeper understanding about Jesus Christ being the Lamb of God. For the corporate prayer, the words will be on the screen. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for creating mankind to have a relationship with you. I know that I have sinned and that my sin has put a rift between you and I. Father God, I'd like to have this rift in our relationship eliminated. And the only way this can be done is if I become born again by accepting your gift of salvation, believing that Jesus Christ is your Son, who came to die for my sins, and that you raised him from the dead. Father God, I believe this to be true, and I ask you to forgive me of my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. 
Thank you that the Holy Spirit now dwells within me, and I ask that I be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Lord God Almighty, thank you that Jesus Christ is your Lamb, who died for the sins of all of humanity. And if we believe in him, then we will be forgiven of our sins and delivered from our sinful nature. Thank you, Father God, that you have cleansed me from my sins because you provided your Lamb to die in my place for my sins. I ask, Father God, that you would help me share this good news with others because your Lamb, Jesus, died for them too and not keep this good news to myself. I ask this in Jesus' holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. If you meaningfully pray the prayer, welcome to the family of God. And I pray that you joyfully and consistently work with the Holy Spirit to develop within you what God wants to develop within you and to have a deeper understanding of what it means to have Jesus Christ as a Lamb of God who died for your sins. I'll close with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for the day you blessed us with. Thank you, God, for the week that you safely brought us through. Thank you, Father, for your word. We praise you for your faithfulness, God, and I pray, Lord, that each and every one of us chooses to work with the Holy Spirit to have a deeper understanding of what it means to have Jesus Christ as your Lamb who died for our sins and to have a relationship with you because of that sacrifice. Father God, I ask, Lord, that you go before us and make our paths straight, Father God, that your favor would be evident in our lives, Father. Help us to notice when you answer our prayers and that you are with us each and every moment of every day, Father. I pray, Lord, that you keep us safe and bring us back safely next week. We thank you and praise your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming to Hand in Hand with God, a flowing fountain lifestyle. Go with God and no one else. God bless you, and thanks again for coming. God bless you. Go with God and no one else. Thanks for watching. Thank you.